Greetings! It's World Series time. You probably heard, well, maybe not. Maybe you didn't hear about this. About a group of baseball players that refused to go to a Star Wars movie. They thought the title was The Umpire Strikes Back. No, not a true story. But I hope you enjoyed it. We recently celebrated the Festival of Tabernacles and the eighth day of Sacred Assembly, and you probably heard these verses read from the Gospel of John. And the point is, God wants to be with us. He, a being so great, we can't really properly describe how great, and yet this being because of his greatness, because he is omnibeneficent, perfect love, he wants to be with us. He created us to be his sons and his daughters and to be with him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As we know, God is described that way in the book of Exodus. God wants to be with us, and in the beginning, he actually was visible to Adam and Eve, Evidently, as, as, as a man, of course, I would imagine in some special way a divine being, but yet manlike. Uh, he created Adam and Eve, and they interacted with him. And uh, in verse uh, 6, I'm sorry, in Genesis 3 and um, verse 8, okay, Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the, of the eternal God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Our ancestors hid from God. So initially it was human beings who had rebelled against God in a very dramatic way and then hid from him. And he heard and he they heard the sound of the of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Yahweh, the eternal, Adonai Hashem, the Lord God, Adonai Elohim. They hid from, from God, but God wants to be with us. However, once we made the decision to hide from God, God, generally speaking, is invisible. We don't see him and yet his hand is directing human events. As John, as, uh, uh, the, John writes in the third chapter of his gospel, Jesus Christ talking about being born again spiritually, and he says that the impact is like the impact of the wind. You don't see it, but yet you see the impact of it. And so you don't literally see God, but you see him in nature, and you see him working through history. And, and hopefully you see him working in your life. And yet he, has, at this time in history, is invisible. I want to go to Isaiah 45 and verse 15. Isaiah 45 and verse 15. Truly you are God who, uh, you are God who hide him yourself. O God of Israel, the Savior. So God is our Savior. He is the God of Israel. He cares about human beings. He took one nation to be a model nation, and ultimately the other uh, peoples will become a spiritual Israel and will have a converted humankind ultimately. But at this time in history, he is a God who voluntarily is behind the scenes. So we see the impact of God without directly seeing God. But ultimately, God will be directly interacting with us and we will see for example the returning jesus christ the word of god will return as as a spirit being but also as the resurrected um, a man jesus christ and he will return and be king over all the world and then ultimately there'll be a, a, a complete union of 
spirit beings, sons and daughters of God with God the Father, as, as we will see, uh, as you know, and I will quote again later on. Let's take a look then at see how God through history, although he generally is not seen, occasionally does come and interact very directly with human beings. We know that he wrestled with Jacob, for example. I don't have time to go into that episode today. We know he appeared to Joshua before the conquest of the land. And so God d does appear at times as his own spokesperson, as, as the word of God, as a, as a messenger, Malach, as the messenger of God who is uncreated, the uncreated angel, the word of God manifested as a man-like man angelic being communicating with us. That is to say, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. A lot, there's a lot of heavy theology there. Where do we find this first? We find it with a woman who is a Gentile, who is a servant, <laughs> a woman of Egypt. She is the first to have this experience of actually God interacting with her, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, um, at, least, at least directly in the Bible. Now, Abraham, of course, has God interacting with him. Uh, it, it, we don't exactly know how. We know God spoke to Abraham. Uh, Abraham is the father of all those who believe. But as far as an actual clear manifestation expressed in Scripture, we see it in Genesis 16. Hagar is being treated harshly by, by uh, Sarai, and, and of course she brought it on herself, but then she flees. But then uh, here we see um, in verse 7, Now the angel of the Lord, now if this is capitalized in my English translation, because this is God, as his own uh, communicator. This is the Logos. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Now the angel of the eternal found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring, uh, of the, by the, uh, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the eternal said to return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the eternal said to her, to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. She is the mother of Ishmael, the father of the Arab peoples. And uh, more prophecies are, are, are said about, um, well, I'll read them because there's a play on words here. Yishmael, God hears, God will hear. Yishmael. And the angel of the eternal said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the eternal has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So it seems to indicate that uh, he, he would be around the Israelites, uh, and yet, you know, a distinct people. Uh, and evidently, I could be understanding this because the Arab peoples, although they have a common ancestor, they seem to uh, be uh, over history divided into groups and, and, and battling one another often in their history. But notice how her, her reaction to this. Uh, now, I could say a lot more about Ishmael. I want to say a little more today about Ishmael because this is a, a, a prophecy uh, that has historic implications, obviously. Abraham had, had Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael was the firstborn, but not through Sarah. And the covenant went through Sarah. It went to Isaac. But Ishmael was going to be a great people, as, as, you, uh, you, as I read. Then she called the name of the Eternal who spoke to her. So she, she called Yahweh by a name, by another name. And, he call, he, and, she, and, the, and this name was, You are the God who sees. Oh, for she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? So she knew she was looking at God uh, in, in the form of this angel. And so she called the name of the place. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lachai Roi, the well of him, who is, of him who is alive and sees me. Maybe that's why I hope that's what my margin is going to say. Uh, my margin says, well of the one who lives and sees me, okay? And, uh, and so 
that became the name of that well. That and so that later on, Isaac lived in that area. Interesting. When when Rebecca meets Isaac, he's uh, coming from that area. And so in verse fifteen, let's let's uh, continue on. There, there was a location that the people reading Genesis in the time of Moses could be aware of where that well was. Therefore, the well was called Ber Lahai Roi. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And in Genesis 17 and verse 18, Abraham pleads to God, and Abraham said to God, this is Genesis 17, 18, oh, let Ish, oh that Ishmael might live before you, because he's too old to have a child, Sarah's too old to have a child, but it's a miraculous birth, like the birth of Jesus Christ. And Isaac was the child of the covenant. But he pleaded for Ishmael. In verse 19, then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. Of course, miraculously. And you shall call his name Isaac. You know, laughter. Ha <laughs> ha, Yitzchak, he will laugh. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Okay, play on words. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time uh, next year, which would be the uh, days of unleavened bread that season. All right, I want to go now to Genesis 25. In Genesis 21, you see that God intervenes miraculously uh, for Hagar and Ishmael after they're driven out, and uh, they settle in the Sinai area initially. Uh, but in Genesis 25, even though Ishmael had been driven out, he reconciles with Isaac, evidently. This is a verse very important uh, to Jewish people, and I want to take a look at it. This is Genesis 25 and verse 9. That when Abraham dies, Isaac and Ishmael come together to bury him. And you're going to hear rabbis referring to this a lot as I speak. I'm speaking on October 24th, 2020. We've, had, we've already had a peace agreement between Egypt and Jordan, but those were not really uh, entirely warm uh, peace, although it's, they're getting there. They're warming up now. And part of that has to do with other war, more warm arrangements, UAE, Bahrain. And now we have Sudan. Wow. And there are more coming. Uh, and so uh, this in Genesis 25, verse 9, uh, and, this, and his sons, his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite. So in the uh, city we call in English Hebron. And so Isaac and Ishmael came together to bury their father. So there evidently was would seem to be some kind of reconciliation here. And so we have in our in our own day a reconciliation between Ishmael and uh, and Isaac. Now we'll see uh, if if uh, possibly this is this this will break again possibly depending on how we understand Psalm eighty three, uh, uh, the how how it, it how directly. It, it prophesies end time events, but even if it breaks down, we can be grateful right now that we have it. That Ishmael and Isaac seem to be having, you know, warming up their relationship, and uh, you know, make hay while the sun shines. We'll enjoy it while it lasts. If it doesn't last, we know ultimately in the millennium it will be there. So this is all based upon, of course, as I said, this appearance of God as the angel of the Lord to Hagar. And it all ties in. And so you see God's desire to, to be with us. Uh, as we see in Psalm um, 113, uh, it says in verse 5, Who is like the eternal our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in, in the heavens and in the earth? So he created uh, angelic beings. He created a heavenly realm, and then he created an, a, a, a physical universe, and he created people, and he deals with people. It's amazing. He has, as I said, he's wrestled with Jacob. He appeared to Joshua, and so on. He spoke face to face with Moses. We we read about that in Numbers 12, for example. 
And then finally, the climax of it, uh, at least for, uh, from up to this point, is that God becomes a fertilized egg in the womb of Mary, as, as I read in John. The Logos became a flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, he was very likely born at the Festival of Tabernacles and circumcised on the eighth day of sacred assembly. I want to go to Matthew and uh, read about that because that would be more of a seasonal reading because it likely happened at the time of the Festival of Tabernacles. So I want to go to verse 18 of Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is uh, uh, conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, very likely that happened, that conception, around the time of Hanukkah, if, if he was born at the time of the Festival of Tabernacles. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, uh, because this is a play, it doesn't, it, it's not, the Greek does, it obviously isn't a play on words. You have to go back to Yeshua, uh, short for Yehoshua, the eternal is salvation. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the eternal through the prophet, saying, and here is a, a, a prophecy that in the Greek-speaking world, among the Jews in the Greek-speaking world, it became a tradition that there would be miraculous birth, just as the birth of Isaac was miraculous, there would be miraculous birth of the of this Messiah that a, a virgin would conceive. This is the way the Greek-speaking Jews understood it, you know, the, the huge community that was in Alexandria. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. This is what I'm saying. God wants to be with us. Emmanuel. And if you look at the prophecies in Isaiah and go through 7 and 8, you'll see that play on words there. Emmanuel. You'll see uh, that, that come out uh, if you look at the Hebrew text there in Isaiah. Uh, anyway, behold, a virgin shall... Uh, there's so much I would like to say, but I'm going to try to control myself. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and shall, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So that is a title of the Messiah. So he's more than, the, than, than a, an anointed one. He's our Savior. Only God could be our Savior. I read about it earlier in Isaiah. God is our Savior. So God became the descendant of David. So he is both human and divine now, Jesus Christ. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took uh, him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. There's a lot more I could say about that verse, but I'll leave it for another time. I want to go to Luke. Here is another account of the birth of Christ, which, as I said, was very likely took place during the Festival of Tabernacles. So... Uh, I go to Luke, and th here we see again the importance of the Davidic ancestry. Um, of course, the, it first talks about the birth of John the Baptist, who uh, comes before, uh, who who was born before Jesus Christ. But I want to go to the um, sixth month of um, of Mary's pregnancy. Um, Verse 26, okay? Now, in the sixth month, not of Mary's pregnancy, I'm sorry, of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth was John the Baptist's wife. They were both descendants of Aaron. John the Baptist was a priest uh, of the priestly line. Now, Jesus Christ was of the Davidic line, of the kingly line. So anyway, we go to verse 26. So this is the sixth month of is Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, and there's significance to that. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary, my Miriam. This was Miriam. 
And having come in, the angel said to rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. This must have been a shocking thing to her. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. So it's scary when you encounter an angel. It's scary. Mary, for uh, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Once again, as, as Joseph was told. He will be great and, and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will be with him and, and uh, uh, be with him. I'm sorry, will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Miraculous birth. And uh, just like Abraham was wondering, how, how are we going to have a child? Sarah was wondering. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. So, here, so when, when, we, when we see the power, when we experience the power of God, we're, we are experiencing the, you know, God, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. So that was also miraculous birth. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be, uh, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Uh, I don't know how much more I could, should cover of this. Uh, but uh, she goes to visit Elizabeth. There, Elizabeth ca can see <laughs> that she, just as she has a special child in her womb, so does her, her cousin Mary, uh, even more so. And uh, so we, uh, she talks about that. Then Mary gives this great uh, prayer, which is similar to the prayer of Hannah uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. And then in verse 56... Uh, and Mary re remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Uh, now we want to go to the, um, to the actual birth of Christ. I've covered a little bit of the background. As I said, very likely Mary became pregnant during the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, and then bore the child uh, uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles time, uh, Sukkot. Uh, anyway, and it came to pass, I'm, I'm in chapter 2 now. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be, uh, should be registered. Now, it would seem reasonable that if you're going to have to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you should register at that time. So very likely they came, they came to keep the feast and also to register. Does that make sense? The census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city, and you know the city of David is Beit Lechem, house of bread. Joseph also went up from Galilee. What do you mean went up from Galilee? Because you go up to Jerusalem, you know, and that's the way it is. Uh, now Jerusalem is higher than the area around it, but Galilee is a hilly area. But nevertheless, when you go to Jerusalem, you go up to Jerusalem. Just as when Jews today go to Israel, they're making Aliyah, they're ascending. And that goes all the way back to uh, the the latter episode of Jacob. Uh, sometime I could comment on that. I'll go on. Um, I'm dropping hints here and there of areas you could study into. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house of, uh, and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger? What a humble beginning. This is the son of God. And he's, he's lying in a trough for animals? A very humble beginning. Well, why, well how did that happen? And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
So it may very well be, you know, you had the combination of people registering, but it very also, very well also could be because it was a festival season. A lot of people were there, and so there was no room. So she had to have the baby somewhere. Now they didn't stay in in the manger when they had an opportunity, you know, in the barn, or they had an opportunity. They they did go to a house later, um, as you'll read if you keep reading. Now they were sh in the same uh, country, shepherds. Uh, living out in the fields, uh, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And so it, it wouldn't seem to be a winter night. That wouldn't be a good time to have the flocks out. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Now Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, so it seems appropriate shepherds would be the ones to come see him. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. By the way, the Festival of Tabernacles is called by the Jews, Zaman Simchatenu, the time of our, uh, of our joy. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Uh, a lot there. That's quite a, a passage. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. That's not typical. So that, that's quite a sign already. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And that will be fulfilled with the second coming of Christ. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, uh, then th that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, which means when he became an adult and began his ministry, there would be many people who had that memory. So this is a way of, of jump-starting the, the, his ministry, which had a tremendous impact at that time, as you know. Although the church was small, there were 120 disciples, but yet the impact was great, in, in, and the church grew greatly after his resurrection. Um, there's so much more I could read. We, we read here about how when it was 40 days and the time to bring him to the temple, they did that, you know, and, and, and so they, they very likely didn't go uh, back to Nazareth, but, but hung around there. Uh, later on, of course, they had to flee, uh, and, and go to Egypt, then finally return to Nazareth after the death of Herod. But uh, anyway, after 40 days, they, uh, you know, they take him uh, to, the, uh, to the temple. And th this is why people who, who, keep, uh, who think that Jesus Christ was born on December 25th, in Mexico there's a big festival on February 2nd. In America it's Groundhog Day, but down there it's a festival commemorating in their minds the, the uh, dedication of Jesus Christ, the redemption of the firstborn, the Pidjon Haben, uh, redemption of the firstborn. I, as a priest, uh, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, had the opportunity to perform that ceremony for my cousin, Alan. Uh, I was, I, as a priest, I had the opportunity to receive five silver dollars and <laughs> redeem. Uh, we had a Pidjon Haben ceremony for, for my uh, cousin, Alan. Anyway, uh, they had the, the uh, they did the various things you're supposed to do, uh, you know, in the, in the temple, and they met a a, a, a man a righteous man named Simeon, uh, and they met uh, Anna, uh, who was of the tribe of Asher, and you know you can read about that. Uh, I'll, I'll just let you read about that uh, as a maybe a homework assignment. Uh, in, in verse 33, I'm in Luke 2:33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit more now uh, about what Simeon says. Well, I'll, I'll read the rest of this passage. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, the child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. And the thoughts of many hearts, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So much contained there in that prophecy by Simeon. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess 
the daughter of Fanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of, of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. Uh, that's probably what the uh, intent is. Not that she was 84 years a widow, but that she was 84 years old. But if she was 84 years a widow, that would make her, make her over 100, uh, you know, which isn't impossible uh, for that matter, you know, just in normal human events. But uh, in any case, she was quite old. She had been married, but had been a virgin for a long time. Uh, and she was very much devoted to, to serving God in the temple. She had dedicated herself to, to service in the temple. I'm reading verse 37. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming uh, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So um, she, again, played a role in spreading this, this account so that when he reached adulthood, there would be those who had that memory. So when they had to performed all, all things, now very likely this would have taken place at the end of this eighth month. I'm speaking in the eighth month. Uh, I'm speaking in the Roman month of October 2020. And uh, we, we, we've already been through the festival season and we're in the, early in the eighth month. Probably late in the eighth month is when this, this, uh, these events occurred. So when they had performed all these things, according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, and there's prophetic implications there. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So here we have the word of God in the flesh. We have God becoming human so that humans could become, in a sense, divine, so that we could become sons and daughters of God and can and share eternity with him. And you know all he went through uh, to accomplish that. It's, it's you know, in the Gospels, and we'll be commemorating his sacrifice on uh, uh, on the Lord the night of the Lord's Supper, the New Testament Passover night, which will be in the spring. And uh, we'll be uh, thinking about his resurrection as we begin counting towards Pentecost and so forth. So we see that God at times appeared to human beings where they could directly talk to him as you're seeing me now and I'm talking to you, but even more directly than that. And then we see that he actually became one of us and went through the entire experience that human beings go through and then the worst possible death at the end. He did all that for us because he wants to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He wants to be with us. And what happens at the end of the of the uh, of history in a way never not the true end of history but uh, the, let's say the end of a certain phase of history uh, I can go to 1st Corinthians 15 and um, uh, I'm gonna go to ver for, I hadn't planned to read this but I'm inspired to read 1st Corinthians 15 24 then comes the end when he Jesus Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. You know, so we, if we just have a, a complete change in history and now we have a, a, the new Jerusalem and we have the new heavens and new earth and we have an intimate relationship with God such as we didn't even have in the millennium or even in the white throne judgment period, be even great, great, greater beyond that. We come to Revelation 21 and verse 4, which uh, no doubt you heard read during this recent festival season. Well, uh, you know, I hope, I hope you heard it read, put it that way. I, I, I Hopefully you did. In Revelation 21 and verse 3, and, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So you see the desire of God, his plan, to, to be with us. We, he has to raise us to his level, and even then he comes down somewhat and tabernacles with us because he's so great that he, in effect, is lowering himself even to be in the spirit realm. He's beyond even, even that. Uh, you know. But he does want to be with us and to share eternity with us and that we be immortal and live forever, forever with one another and with him. 
So being aware of that, let's thank him for that and let's uh, respond appropriately. 1 John 4 and verse 8. <coughs> Pardon me. 1 John 4 and verse 8. I read a Revelation, the Revelation to John, and now I want to read in the epistle of John, the first epistle in the general epistles of, in, of John, 1 John 4 and verse 8. He who does not love does, uh, does not know God, for God is love. God is omnibeneficent. God is perfect love. And in his perfect love, he did all that was necessary so that he could be with us. So as I said a moment ago, let's thank him for it. Let's respond appropriately because God, our creator, wants to be with us. All the best to you and yours.